So in this video, I'm going to be going to several places here in the country of Jordan to talk about the archaeology behind one of the most amazing prophecies in the Bible, known as the Star Prophecy. My first stop is going to be at the Jordan National Museum. Okay, now the first archaeological artifact that I want to show you here is very significant. This is a inscription found in 1967 during excavations at a site down in the Jordan Valley. It dates to the 9th century BC and its opening line translates as the sayings of Balaam son of Beor, the man who was a seer. Now the Balaam son of Beor that is in this inscription is the same Balaam son of Beor that is in the Bible. This is significant because he is the seer, the historical seer, who gives the star prophecy. Behind me is a Dead Sea Scroll manuscript that is the oldest preserved copy of the star prophecy that was discovered in cave number four of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It dates to 125 BC. So I'm at the archaeological site that has been identified as Biblical Beth Peor, looks down over the Jordan Valley, and so from here, some 3,400 years ago, Balaam son of Beor gave the star prophecy. So what is the star prophecy? Who is the star? And what is the evidence that this is the Biblical site, the authentic site that the Bible is talking about? Let's take a quick look at the geography and ancient sites connected with a star prophecy. These places are located in the Jordan Valley, just to the north of the Dead Sea. Located in ancient Canaan, to the west of the Jordan River, and on the western edge of the Jordan Valley, is the fortified city of Jericho. East of Jericho is the Jordan River, and east of the Jordan River, on the eastern edge of the Jordan Valley, is the fortified city of Shittim. The cities of Jericho and Shittim are east and west of each other, on opposite sides of the Jordan Valley. The biblical city of Shittim, or sometimes called Abel Shittim, is today known locally as Tel El Hammam. Next, I'm heading down into the Jordan Valley uh, to the site of Tel El Hammam. So I'm here at Tel El Hammam, and in the biblical world, when you have the ruins of cities stacked on top of each other that make these ancient mounds, uh, this part of the world, they're called tells. And this is one of the largest tells in Jordan. So why have scholars identified this site with Biblical Shittim? Well, for, uh, for starters, the geography matches. The descriptions in the Bible and the location of this site is a match. Numbers 25.1 says Israel was staying at Shittim, across from Jericho. The location of Tel El Hammam fits the biblical location of Shittim, since it is located directly across the Jordan Valley from Jericho. To the west, the Bible describes Shittim as opposite Beth Peor, and again, Tel El Hammam is located opposite, or west of, the archaeological site of Beth Peor. We have this line described in the Bible, Beth Peor, Shittim, the Jordan River, Jericho, and that's exactly how this site lines up. We also know it archaeologically um, because this tell has been excavated, and the material that comes from these excavations uh, demonstrates that this site, this ancient mound, was an occupied city at the time of Moses and Joshua, and therefore at the time that the star prophecy was given by Balaam son of Beor. This was uh, the headquarters for the Israelites uh, as they prepared to cross over the Jordan River to the west of us here into the Promised Land. It was because Israel was staying in Shittim that Joshua sent two spies from Shittim to look over the land, especially Jericho. 
and why when the Israelites left to cross over the Jordan River, they set out from Shittim. Shittim is their headquarters and therefore uh, this would be the place that the tabernacle would have been set up. In Numbers 2, the Lord said, the Israelites are to camp around the tent of meeting. The tabernacle, the ta tabernacle was at the center. That means that uh, Shittim here at Tel El Hamam would have been at the center of the camp. Because Israel was camped on the west side of the Jordan Valley around their headquarters city of Shittim, Balak, king of Moab, summoned the seer, Balaam son of Beor, to place a curse on them. When Balaam arrived, Balak took him to three rocky high places to view the camp of Israel below. Starting in the south and moving north, these three lookouts were named Bamoth Baal, Pisgah, and Beth Peor. Then this site, Tel El Hamam, as biblical Shittim, serves for us as a uh, anchor point for what we want to understand about the star prophecy. Because Balaam, son of Beor, is moving from peak to peak, these three peaks from the south to the north, and he's giving these different oracles, but this whole time what he's looking at, what he's looking down at, is the camp of Israel. Okay, so I am heading up out of the Jordan Valley, up on top of the plateau, and um, I'm going to the rocky peak that is the furthest away from Shittim, and that is Bamoth Baal. I am on Bamoth Baal. Uh, Bamoth Baal is the first place that Balak, king of Moab, brings Balaam, son of Beor. Now, uh, there's no structures up here, or anything like that, but there is scattered pottery all over the place up here on this high place, this viewpoint, and this is the uh, site that makes geographical sense for being Bamoth Baal. From here it says that Balaam can only see the outskirts of the camp of Israel. The tabernacle would have been at Shittim, at Tel El Hamam, which is still quite a distance to the north of here. And so, um, and so the outskirts that Balaam would have been looking at from here would have been the southern outskirts of the camp of Israel. He says, from the rocky peaks, I see them. I see Israel. And he's absolutely overwhelmed by how many there are. He says, who can count the dust of Jacob? Who can count even a fourth of Israel? And his job is to put a curse on them, but uh, God speaks through him and says, how can I curse what I have not cursed? These are the people that he leads, that he lives, dwells among. How can he curse them? And so when Balaam goes to curse them, actually a blessing comes out instead. And this uh, causes great stress to uh, Balak. But he says, okay, let's go to another viewpoint, which is north of here, across the valley to Pisach, he takes him. And so um, that's at Mount Nebo, and we'll follow in the footsteps of Balaam and Balak. And so we will go from here, Bamoth uh, Baal, to Pisach, Mount Nebo. So now I've moved over to Pisgah, which is Mount Nebo. Now, this is the biblical site that is called both Mount Nebo and Pisgah in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse one. It's basically the lookout, the viewpoint from Mount Nebo. Now, of course, this is uh, where Moses died, but before Moses died, he looked out over the promised land. And uh, before that event, Balaam, son of Beor, was here. And so, while Moses was looking out over the promised land, Balaam, son of Beor, was looking down at the promised people. We're further north than we were at Bamoth Baal, but we're still quite a bit to the south of uh, Shittim, uh, Tel El Hamam, where the tabernacle would have been. I can see the Tel of uh, Shittim from here. 
However, there's no way I would be able to see from here the tabernacle, it would be too small. What I would be able to see and what I believe Balaam was looking at was the glory cloud that came up from the Holy of Holies of the tabernacle. He starts out by saying in his oracle what God is not. He says, God is not human. And then he goes on to, to say the name of God. Yahweh, because we have Lord all in capital letters, so that means Yahweh is there. Yahweh their God is with them. The shout of their king is among them. What is Balaam seeing from here? He's seeing the God of Israel and his glory cloud and his presence coming up from the Holy of Holies of the tabernacle. So this is the king that Balaam is referring to. He's not talking about a human king. They won't have a human king for several more centuries until the time of King Saul. And then from here it says in Numbers 23, 27 through 28, it says, Then Balak said to Balaam, Come, let me take you to another place. And Balak took Balaam to the top of Peor, overlooking the wasteland. So to follow their movement, Balak and Balaam, then we need to go another uh, valley over this. And so we need to cross that valley to the next ridge over which is where Beth Peor is. So I've crossed over uh, the Valley of Moses uh, from Pisgah, and now I'm on the ridgeline and descending down to uh, the final peak that we're gonna go to, the final high place of Beth Peor. Now I am here at the archeological site identified as Beth Peor. Now why uh, is this Beth Peor? Well, for one thing, it's at the precise right location. Deuteronomy 3.29 says Shittim is located in the valley opposite Beth Peor. This matches the location of the archaeological site identified as Beth Peor since it is opposite or east of Shittim at Tel El Hammam. This is the site identified as Beth Peor. This is the site identified as Shittim. These two sites are opposite each other meaning they are east and west of each other. Deuteronomy chapter 34 says that Moses died on Mount Nebo at the top of Pisgah and was buried in the valley opposite Beth Peor. This shows that Pisgah and Beth Peor are located opposite each other with a valley between them. And indeed the two archaeological sites identified as Pisgah and Beth Peor are located opposite, that is north and south of each other with a valley separating them that is known to this day as Wadi Musa, the Valley of Moses. This particular site also is significant because as you come down this ridge line, when you get to this precise place where this archaeological site is, for the first time you get a view down into the Jordan Valley. And I'm looking straight down on uh, Shatim at Tel El Hammam. Remember that in the um, previous two high places at Bamoth and Pisgah, Balaam could only see a portion of the Israelite camp. But from here it says that Balaam looked down on the Israelites encamped tribe by tribe. Now the other thing that helps us to understand is I'm standing at an archaeological site. Uh, it is in the Roman period, a Roman fort, but the pottery goes back much earlier than that, back into Old Testament times. Now it is from here that Balaam gives the star prophecy in Numbers chapter 24, verse 17. He says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. He sees this person who is a star coming out of Jacob. Now, in order to understand this, we need to understand the symbol of a star in ancient times. The Bible in Amos 5.26 refers to idols as the star of your God. The various gods of the nations are often represented by the symbol of a star. In ancient times, a star symbol represented deity. A star was a god. And in my book, Where God Came Down, The Archaeological Evidence, I cover also uh, the scepter. And I have many pictures of a royal scepter in my book here. If you're interested in getting a copy of this book, I'll leave a way that you can uh, link where you can order it in the description below. Um, so a scepter 
is the symbol of a king. So just as star means God, scepter means king. When the prophecy says a scepter will rise out of Israel, it means a king will rise out of Israel. We know this Assyrian is a king because he holds a scepter. He also is pointing to his star god. So what Balaam, son of Beor, is saying is that the most important thing about these people camped down below here is that not now, not near, but in the future, from them will come the God King. From them will come the Divine King. Israelites believed in only one star. They had only one star. Besides their God, there was no other God. And so the concept of a star coming out of Jacob meant that Yahweh himself was going to come out of Jacob. He was going to become an Israelite. This explains why there are so many stars found in the Jewish archaeological context. The star on this Israelite handle is dated to the 7th century BC. This star stamped handle from Jerusalem is from the 2nd century BC, when stars are also commonly found on Jewish coins. Stars are also commonly found in the decorations of synagogues. So according to this prophecy, then who is the star? What does the star represent? The star represents the coming Messiah. Where does this come from? It comes from the Torah itself, the book of Numbers. Jerusalem is located in the mountains on the west side of the Jordan Valley on an ancient road known as the Ridge Route. On the mountains on the east side of the Jordan Valley is the city of Heshbon, located on an ancient route called the King's Highway. A major route connecting the King's Highway and Ridge Route passed by Beth Peor and Abel Shittim. This was the main approach to Jerusalem from the east and later was made into a Roman road. The Roman name for Shittim at Tel El Hammam was Libius. Around AD 330, the historian Eusebius wrote about a site he called Beth Fagor that was opposite Jericho, six miles above Libius. Beth Fagor is Beth Peor. Beth Peor was marked with Roman mile markers, inscribed with six Roman miles, but were later taken by archaeologists to Mount Nebo to be displayed in the museum there. In the New Testament, Matthew 2.1 says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Since the Magi came to Jerusalem from the east, the logical route they would have taken is the road that passed by Beth Peor, since this is the main approach to Jerusalem from the east. Next to the archaeological site of Beth Peor, evidence for this road can still be seen. The Roman road comes right past the site here. What is the archaeological evidence for the road? Well, we have um, the remnant of these leftover pillars that are strewn around. Here is the base of one. There's another one, piece of a pillar behind me. You see here part of a pillar from the Roman road. The Roman road came right through here. So these Roman pillars like this one have rolled down the hill. And so we have evidence that the Roman road came through here. Uh, some of the pillars were taken over to uh, be displayed in a museum. These are the actual Roman mile markers that Eusebius saw and that he is writing about. And these were brought over from Beth Peor to be displayed here um, on the grounds at Mount Nebo. It's significant because this is also the logical route that the Magi took in Matthew chapter 2 in the first century AD. They would have come through here. What were they following? They were following a star. The star prophecy is fulfilled when Jesus is born in Bethlehem. And so the Magi are going to worship the star and the scepter, the uh, God King that has been become an Israelite. And so they're coming through here on this Roman road, right past the site where here, about 1400 years earlier, Balaam gives the star prophecy. And now they're going to meet the one who is the fulfillment of that. They first go to Jerusalem. They ask, uh, where is the king that has been born? We've seen his star rise in the east and we have come to worship him. He's not just a human king. 
He's the God King. Then they uh, follow the star on from there to Bethlehem until it comes to rest over the child, and then they bow down and worship him. It's not surprising then that the star also became a Christian symbol. These stars adorned the mosaic floors of ancient churches, symbolizing Jesus the Messiah, who in Revelation 22:16 declared himself to be the bright morning star. Um, in the medieval period, we get this different interpretation about uh, the star prophecy, that the star prophecy is really about King David. That's who it was talking about. Um, and, and so uh, an interpretation that it's the Messiah um, or that it's referring to Jesus would be considered a Gentile interpretation, a wrong interpretation, a Christian interpretation. However, the oldest copy of the star prophecy that we have is in the Jordan National Museum. It comes from the Dead Sea Scrolls and it's dated to 125 BC. What does BC stand for? Before Christ. 125 years before Jesus fulfilled the star prophecy by being born in Bethlehem, we have this oldest copy that preserves this uh, this prophecy, and not only that, but it's not actually a direct quote of the prophecy. It's Jews at that time writing down their expectation that Balaam, son of Beor's prophecy about the star and the scepter coming is still going to take place. It's still going to be fulfilled. Jesus is the star because he is the fulfillment of Balaam, son of Beor's prophecy that he had given about 1400 years earlier from this very spot. I will leave a link in the description below where you can order a copy of my book. Uh, please give this video a like if you enjoyed it and subscribe to the channel and you'll want to watch this other video about the archeology span of Bethlehem. Bethlehem is the place where Jesus was born when he fulfilled the star prophecy.